Now, you'll know, you of course know that David Davis yesterday at PMQ said in the name of God, go to Boris Johnson. Do you agree with him? No, I don't. I think that um, the, uh, the, the practice in this country is quite clear, that however indignant the people outside the courtroom are uh, when a great case uh, is brought, the, the, the defendant is entitled to be given a proper trial. And that is what is happening with the Sue Gray report. Until we see that, I think that justice demands that Boris is given his place in court, if you like. Um, and I don't think anything has changed. I, uh, I have no idea what Sue Gray will say, but of course, it's quite obvious to anybody that the Prime Minister is in deep trouble. <laughs> We'll come back to that in a second. In terms of the people who were allegedly plotting um, the, the so-called pork pie pooch, uh, did they move too soon? Well, I don't think they've moved. They had a meeting. That's very common in, in politics. But, uh, well, I don't know what they've done. No one knows except uh, Graham Brady, who, who, who gets the letters. Um so, so I don't think anything has changed, actually, over the last 24 hours on the big scene. Mm. We have to wait for Sue Gray. Well, indeed. Um, but you said that you, you feel that, that the Prime Minister is in, in trouble. Um, let's talk about how we got to this position then. We've spoken to uh, many former politicians uh, over uh, the last couple of weeks. We spoke to William Haig, who appears on the station uh, regularly, and we asked him... Uh, what he thought of uh, the allegations surrounding parties at, at number 10. And he said that he had been appalled at what had gone on. Um, what do you think? Uh, we, I understand that you were waiting for the Sue Gray report. But first of all, are you appalled by what happened? And what can Boris Johnson do to save himself following um, the Sue Gray report? Uh, I think what happened in number 10 is inexplicable and indefensible if it is as simple as we obviously believe it to be. Um, uh, but, of course, there is a much bigger issue here because the Prime Minister is effectively being accused of lying and uh, nothing could be more serious than that. He's accused of having uh, misled the House of Commons. That is a death blow in, in every circumstance. But... On the bigger issue of Brexit, the same allegations are true that, as Lord Frost's resignation so clearly reveals, the Brexit agenda was a pack of lies. It's not going to be delivered. There's not going to be a bonfire of regulations. We have a border in Northern Ireland. We have a replication of the European deals in our trade negotiations across the world. And that is not Brexit. So what happens if <clears throat> excuse me what happens if Boris goes does Brexit go does it throw the whole thing up in the air will the majority now of people who believe Brexit was wrong have another chance to express their view and, and against this background <coughs> there, <coughs> I'm very sorry against this background there is this confidence in democracy uh, people are extremely angry and they turn to extremes in those circumstances. We know with horrific consequences in history. Um, so something has to be resolved quickly. And this is against a background where the government is going to be less popular mm. for one stark reason, and that is the falling living standards that are now built into the inflationary cycle. Yes. Now, you, you posed the question, if Boris goes, what happens to Brexit? And, and if I may, I'll pose one to you. If Boris goes, who's next? Well, I'm not prepared to speculate. <laughs> Quite frankly, I suspect my endorsement would be more a liability than an asset <laughs> um, to many members of the right wing of the Conservative Party. So in, in uh, travelling with optimism about the sort of person I'd like to see, I will give them the best possible help I can by not naming them. Well, OK, the qualities in that person then, what, what are you looking for? <clears throat> well, I'm looking for someone who will tell the British people the truth. 
this is the characteristic of conservative prime ministers throughout my life. They told the British people that the days of imperialism are over, that we are now a European power, and we must play our role in the corridors of European power as a leading European nation. Uh, I'm looking for someone who tells the, the, that simple story, how it all began, the hatred of war, the belief it must never happen again, the ending of the petty rivalries of Europe, in a greater cause of uniting in order to play a significant and important role on the world stage. And it is unforgivable that Britain has been taken out of that world. We have now left an empty chair in the corridors of European power. And this is a subject of deep resentment to a growing number of people, particularly young people. And I want somebody leading the Conservative Party back to the sanity and the integrity that has characterised their leadership in my political lifetime. Now, you were involved, uh, Lord Heseltine, in your own skirmish with um, a prime minister. You also uh, tried to uh, stand for the leadership of, of, of the Conservative Party. Um, what parallels, if any, can we draw between what went on back then and what's going on now? Uh, only one. That is the ruthlessness of the Conservative Party. Conservative Party understands that to achieve political results, you need power. And uh, the way you get power is through the democratic process, and you usually do that by appealing to a broad range of opinion that is loosely called the centre ground. Um, uh, that is what the Conservative Party understands, and it's why it is the most successful political party in the history of democracy. Uh, I hope somebody will emerge who realises that you cannot be a sort of section of society uh, remote from the interests of a great number of people. We need a unifying figure, and uh, we need a figure that is prepared to deliver the promises that they make. And let me talk about devolution. Uh, it is appalling that two years after the... Uh, uh, general election, we still haven't had a white paper on devolution. And I'll tell you one other thing. If we get one now, as the, the leaks tell me we're going to, the effect, the real effect of devolution will not be seen this side of the election. I know I've done more devolution and regeneration than probably other, any other cabinet minister, and I know how long it takes to consult, to plan, to devise, to get permissions uh, before you can actually start spending the real money that devolution implies.